Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, amen. Today we're going to continue from where we left off. Um, last time we finished up to chapter 2, verse 5, and so we'll continue on. And, and just as a reminder, we're going to upload these videos, um, and we're going to continue with the series of First Peter, um, and we're going to upload the videos directly to YouTube on Saturdays, um, rough, like before or at around 7.30, depending on how crazy the schedule is for Saturdays. And so we'll begin with chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. <clears throat> Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And so as St. Augustine said, that the cornerstone connects two walls. So if you're wondering what a cornerstone is. And when the, the wicked Jews, this is St. Augustine saying, when the wicked Jews rejected the faith, he connected those who believe in him with those who were previously Gentiles. And thus he joined the two without any prejudice toward the Jews as, the, as their thought in their blind fanaticism. And so we see again, kind of in, in verse six, <clears throat> a trademark of St. Peter, if you will. St. Peter references the Old Testament again. He says, um, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, um, and he references our Lord Jesus Christ as the living stone, which is confirmed in scripture in Isaiah 28, when he says, behold, I lay in Zion a chosen honored cornerstone, and he who believes on him will not be put to shame. And so our Lord Jesus Christ is the honored stone that brings salvation, the cornerstone of the new temple. And he who believes on him will not be put to shame on the last day. But we see a condition in verse 6. The honor and the inclusion in the new temple are only for those who believe. And those who encounter him with proud hearts, um, with a lack of humility, who disbelieve, will not find salvation. And so the Lord Christ is also um, this mysterious cornerstone who joined the wall of the Old Testament and the wall of the New Testament. And, you know, a perfect illustration is this on, on Mount Tabor in the Transfiguration. Uh, when we see um, Moses and Elijah, right, meeting with the three disciples. And so we see this uniting of the uh, two testaments, if you will, declaring that our Lord is the cornerstone of the law and the prophecies um, and the preaching of the gospel. And so we go on to verse 7. Therefore, to you who believe... He is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they, were all, they, were all, they also were appointed. St. Augustine said, the Jews knew him and they crucified him, but the whole world heard about him and believed in him. And so our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed the stone of God, but for the proud ones, he will be the stones which the builders rejected. This is in Psalm 118. Him who they despise and refuse, uh, for them he will prove a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. This is Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, verse 14, they will stumble and fall over this stone and, you know, be cast eternally in, in, in oblivion. Their condemnation results not from any fault in our Lord Jesus Christ as the stone, but because they are disobedient to the word of the gospel. And this, you know, this fate, they were also set by God. It is not, however, that God overrides their free will so that they have no choice but to disobey and reject the gospel. No, it's his grace. God decreed that the proud should find their judgment and doom by stumbling over one who came in humility. And so their proud hearts are ready to stumble, and Christ provides the occasion for their fall. And St. Peter stresses this to show that, that it all depends on whether one believes or disbelieves. This is verse 7. And so the believer's faith is central to their salvation, right? So again, St. Peter is saying, pay attention and, and listen to this and cling to your faith, right? In all persecution, in all kinds of troubles, cling to your faith. In verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because they're not destined for doom, right? Since we are founded on the cornerstone and are attached to him, we are a chosen generation. It's a beautiful promise. It's a beautiful title that we're given. Unlike the believers, right? Um, they are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own acquisition. He called them in baptism and he made them his own so that they might declare out their worship uh, and in their daily life, the virtues and glory of him who has called them from the darkness of paganism and death into his marvelous and miraculous light. And so the light and life of his kingdom into which God called them is just, is remarkable. And the change is, it's, it's, it's astounding, right? We, we can't even understand it. And so in describing these Gentiles as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own acquisition, who will declare out his virtues, um, St. Peter applies the titles given to Israel, right? Um, these are titles that you see in, in Isaiah chapter 43, Exodus 19, um, because the church is the true Israel, and they are now God's chosen race of people, different from all people of the world. They are his royal priesthood, set apart as a community with access to his presence. They are a holy nation, protected by God who watches over his holy ones. They are a people for his own acquisition. They are his very treasure. They are valued. They are guarded by him, right? And in verse 10, <clears throat> who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so the Gentiles were separated from God no longer. While they were pagans, they were not a people with any dignity. But now they have, they are, they have the title of being a people of God. Once they had received mercy, they, they, did, they didn't have access to receiving mercy, they were, but they were uh, destined for, for wrath. And th this was kind of reserved for those who are adult, adulterers. But now they have received mercy as God's chosen people, right? Um, and so in Christ God, God has united them to himself and made them his own people, and they belong to the pagan world no longer. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul and so after saint peter concludes his speech about the foundation on our lord jesus christ as the chief cornerstone and proclaiming his praises he starts to clarify the importance of proper conduct right in verse 11 he says beloved i beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against the soul and so we kind of see a transition in chapter two. St. Peter now begins a new section, addressing his hearers as beloved, because of now we're going to hear pastoral care for them. And sometimes it comes in the form of a rebuke, but we'll see. So he says, beloved, it's important that these Gentiles think of themselves different from the secular world around them as belonging to now the kingdom of God. And so therefore, St. Peter, he exhorts them as sojourners and exiles on earth to live differently from the pagan neighbors. Sojourners are those who live in one place, although they were born and belong elsewhere, and who therefore do not fit in with their present surroundings. And they can always be recognized by the natives as foreigners. And so St. Peter urges his hearers to recognize that since their baptism, they now no longer fit in with the pagan culture surrounding them. And this culture is characterized by fleshly desires and sinful practices such as lust and greed and gluttony and drunkenness. As those who now belong to the kingdom, they must abstain from these since they, these desires um, wage against the soul. Indulging such appetites, you know, may seem to lead a fulfillment of happiness, but it's short-lived. It actually lives to, leads to death. And true life consists in righteousness and avoiding these practices. 
And sometimes we feel like uh, as Christians, we have it all backwards that if we're too close to the church, we're, we're missing out on life. No, true life consists in, in avoiding these fleshly lusts. And so um, the thought is that indulging in these desires wars against the person's own good and true life. Okay. And so in verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what's the benefit of avoiding fleshly desires and having good conduct among the Gentiles? It also accomplishes something else. We note that, and, and you know, um, St. Peter writes to his audience as if they were not Gentiles themselves, right? You know, so they, in Christ, they, they left this old self and are our new creation. And in a number of instances, their Gentile neighbors speak against them as evildoers, right? And this is very relatable today. It, those of us who hold on to our Christian ideals, we're called out as intolerant. We're called out as, as evildoers, right? Um, the Christians indeed tend to withdraw from the, the drunken parties and the social activities, characteristics of the Gentile life, and they have gained a reputation as like antisocial haters, right, of, uh, of mankind as a result. And so they are accused of, of really, you know, awful things, um, you know. And so St. Peter says that by doing good works, they can help reverse that judgment so that their neighbors observe their works and they may perhaps come to repent and become believers themselves and so glorify God in the day of visitation, the day of judgment in the last day. So works like almsgiving and feeding and clothing the poor and taking in societies, um, those who are cast off, um, these things have an evangelic uh, value as well. So verse 13, therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, <clears throat> whether to the king as supreme or to governors as, though, as, to, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do no good. <clears throat> Sorry, who do good. In their uh, interaction with the society around them, St. Peter urges them to submit for the Lord's sake to every human creation. And so the, the word uh, creation uh, uh, is used elsewhere uh, for the creation of the world and for all those who are in it. And so he urges this word to show that even in, in a pagan society, those who demand our submission are still the creation of God. And so if we submit to them for the Lord's sake, it is a way of submitting to him, to Christ. And the Christians are tempted to refuse the submission because those who demand uh, the submission and those, yeah, those who demand are pagan. And so this is all the more important. And in the case, um, so St. Peter writes to tell his readers that proper submission to the authorities is lawful for Christians. That applies not only to the king or to the emperor, but the one surpassing all in authority, but also gives, uh, but also to governors since they are sent by him right, sent by the king. And so this submission to governing authorities should present no, you know, dilemma, no internal dilemma, since the local authorities, um, their task is preservation of the public order. And so, you know, avenging on evildoers and praise of, of good doers, um, uh, the, the avenging and the punishment of criminals and rewarding of public benefactors is the task of government and Christians should submit to it to help fulfill these, these good goals. These are good goals. And then in verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. In this way, they will also fulfill the will of God. That is, by doing good, they will silence 
the ignorance of, of foolish men. And so their, their enemies accuse them of all sorts of evil things, like what we said before. They're accusing the Christians of being evildoers. But the Christian good work will demonstrate that their accusations against them are ignorant and uninformed, and it will silence them. Okay, And then verse 16, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Some Christians may feel that their spiritual freedom is demeaned by submission to um, pagan rulers. You know, in context, the, the Jewish zealots felt this very uh, clearly. But St. Peter insists this is not so. They are indeed living as free men, but must not have that freedom as a covering of wickedness. So those who protest, that is, demeaning to submit to legal authorities, usually are not motivated by noble aims, and their desire for freedom is simply a pretext for covering and doing wickedness. We can see this in, the, in our world around us. Christians, although they are free men, have their spiritual freedom rooted in being slaves of God. And slaves should not find obedience demeaning, right? They must not let their spiritual freedom be reduced to, um, to moral, um, to moral like, uh, uh, taken away. In verse 17, honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And so as slaves, they should settle it in their, in their minds to honor all, giving to each one the appropriate respect. Um, and so this basic principle works itself out in various ways. Um, they must love the brotherhood, <clears throat> their fellow Christians. The Christians are called the brotherhood because all believers are spiritual brothers and sisters, siblings, <clears throat> with an obligation of loyalty to that obtained in families. They must fear God, giving to him, first of all, the worship that is due to him. There is here possibly um, a reference to uh, the, the emperor worship, right? But... St. Peter is warning his hearers not to give to the emperor the honor due, which is due for God alone. And so, last of all, they must honor the king, <clears throat> giving, giving to the emperor his proper respect, right? And it's probably significant that the king comes last in this list. After all the obligations to love their fellow believers and to fear God, the king has his proper place but it comes after these other and eternal uh, priorities, which is important for all of us to recognize too. In verse 18, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. This is a very hard verse, right? House slaves or servants are singled out for special attention, not only because of their great numbers, but also because of their special temptation to despise authority. And they're told specifically to submit to their masters, which they must do in all fear of God, submitting to their masters for God's sake. And St. Peter, in this epistle, he always uses the word fear uh, for the fear of God, telling Christians not to fear men. All right, we'll see this in chapter three, uh, chapter three verse 14. And this kind of... Um, exhortation is needed because of the slave's temptation to submit only if the masters were good, right, and gentle. Uh, and they would specifically disobey when the master was crooked or harsh. And they would have, you know, unreasonable demands. They were, they were crooked. And so <clears throat> such harsh treatment is perhaps a possibility for the Christian slave, um, and it becomes more and more uh, because as Christians become more and more socially despised, so they would be treated more harshly. In verse 19, he says, <clears throat> verse 19 and 20, for this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffers wrongfully, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer 
if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And here is a lesson on the cross. If the house slave, for the sake of conscience is, and pleasing God, endures sorrows and punishments when they're unjust, this is nothing to be sad for. No, rather, if they, are, if they do good and, and yet they suffer and they find perseverance and goodness, this finds grace with God and brings his favor. It is returning good for evil that brings God's blessings, not the suffering itself. So for Peter, for, you know, what is this? Um, that suffering is no more than they deserve. It is patient endurance of unjust suffering that brings a divine reward. And we'll go a little bit deeper into this. In verse 21 to verse uh, 24. We're getting close to the end of chapter two. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Again, pointing to the cross. Who committed no sin, nor was, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This is a tall order for our slaves, as it is for all men. So St. Peter backs it up, right, with the inspiration of Christ's example. This endurance of unjust suffering is the very thing which they have and we have been called by Christ. So for St. Peter, when he cites Isaiah 53, he says in verse 9, Christ did no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, so that all his sufferings was unjustified. Nonetheless, while he was verbally abused and reviled by the Sanhedrin at his trial, he did not counter abuse or respond with insults of his own. While suffering the whips and the crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, he did not threaten them with divine punishment or pronounce you know, a curse of God on them. Instead, he delivered himself over to the one judging righteously, entrusting himself to his father from whom true justice would eventually come. In all these responses, Christ was leaving behind a model that his disciples may follow after him in his steps, a, a, a model for us to apply today right? The, the word that's used here for the word model <clears throat> um, refers to um, when a school child uh, copies as a way of learning how to write the alphabet, for example. And so Christ's endurance from unjust suffering sets a norm for his disciples, something that we should copy. We must not protest when our lives come to imitate his unjust, right? For this is how we fulfill our discipleship and learn from the master. His path led to suffering and the cross and only after this to the, to the father's reward. And so like one following after the stepping and the following after and stepping in the steps and footprints that were left before us, we must follow him to his destination of suffering. And so we should not despise unjust suffering. It is honorable. Um, it is the very thing that works for our salvation. So when, when St. Peter alludes to Isaiah 53, verse 5 and verse 12, St. Peter reminds his hearers that the, uh, on the tree of the cross of Christ carries our sins in his body by his stripes that were cured. <clears throat> and so the thought is that Christ carried away our sins in his own body by offering that body as a sacrifice by the, the wounds, the bruises, the stripes that he received there, all were cured and healed of the affliction of sin and death. <clears throat> and so as we wrap up chapter two, we come to verse 25. And this is where we're gonna end for today. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ did all of this for us, that having departed from sins, in which we were once 
um, held, we now might live to righteousness. It is, it is this in which our cure and salvation consists. Formerly, they were straying as sheep, being deceived, being misled by idols, right? Um, they have strayed from the, right, from the right path, wandering into sin, and were helpless as lost sheep in front of wolves. But now they have departed uh, from the sins Christ carried upon the tree and can live to righteousness, having returned to the true path. Now they are safe with their true shepherd and bishop of their souls and lives. As shepherd, Christ will keep them safe in his sheepfold from, from their soul's um, enemies in this age and the next. The bishop or overseer will rule over them and provide for them. And so however vulnerable his, the house slaves are and how they feel, before their unjust master. Christ is their true master, and he will ultimately defend them. And glory be to God forever today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll continue next time. Thanks.